Retain Podcast. First, we've got uh, Justin Welsh here. You know, I'm going to read your tagline off of LinkedIn just because I feel like that's always an easy place to start. Um, yeah. But, you know, you coach SMB SaaS founders to accelerate re- recurring revenue toward 50 million. So, uh, Justin, really appreciate you coming on the podcast today and just talking with us for a few minutes. Yeah, super excited to be here. Thanks for having me, guys. Awesome. Uh, maybe in your own words, just give us a little context as to kind of uh, where you are now, what you've kind of, you know, quick life story, um, how you got here today, and then we'll uh, dive into a few questions. Sure. Um, you know, from about 21 to 28, I was uh, kind of a failure of a sales guy. I, uh, my first three sales jobs, I, I got fired from, never made a sale, never hit a quota, um, was just really kind of an utter failure through the, the beginning of my career, which is, you know, not usually the beginning of everyone's story, but, but it, it was mine. And um, <clears throat> 2009, I got involved in the tech scene in New York, uh, specifically with a company called ZocDoc. They, they reached out to me and it sounded really, really exciting. And this intersection of like really smart people, a really great product, an awesome city in New York, just in maybe even my own maturity, I think all four of those things sort of intersecting at once. It was just the right job for me and my sales career took off and I spent time in various leadership roles at that company over the next five years. And then um, I think what most folks might recognize me from is my most recent job, which was uh, I was the VP of sales and the SVP of sales um, at a company called Patient Pop in Los Angeles. And I built that organization from uh, basically dollar zero, dollar one to uh, over 50 million in recurring in about four and a half years. And then I've spent um, the last uh, eight months uh, really running my own advising and consulting firm. So I, I focus on early stage SMB SaaS founders who want to accelerate the recurring revenue. So that's, that's where I spend most of my time. Awesome. And, you know, I think we, we talked a little bit about this just beforehand um, in kind of the intersection that we find ourselves at and, you know, trying to get some outside perspectives for our audience being a kind of a customer success lens. We typically have leaders of customer success listening. Um, so I think it's, you know, to me, one fascinating that you mentioned, obviously, and openly talk about how you feel like the first seven years, you know, was a, a failure of your sales career. Sure. Um, I think that's something uh, obviously unique, but, um, you know, I'm sure there's a ton of cliche answers that you can give us about what you learned through that period. But I'm just curious, you know, um, as you went through that, and then you got into those um, management positions, and then specifically, when you said you went to go get dollar number one, you know, what is like one thing that you kind of took away from that seven years that you feel like really actually helped you as you started seemingly again from kind of ground zero when you're going to get that first dollar for patient pop? Yeah, I think, you know, in the first seven years where I failed, like, I I kind of expected to do what I was told in training and for the results to just magically happen. And when they didn't, I think I got really frustrated. And I was a young man, like I didn't really understand what it was like to be in the working world. I just gotten out of college and most of my focus was on having fun, right? And and so when I started executing some of the things I learned in training and it didn't work, I had sort of that victim mentality very early in my career. It was like, why me? Why is this happening to me? Why isn't it working? And um, when when I got to ZocDoc uh, in New York, like I remember my manager, Ryan Stam was like, hey, we hustle here. Like we work hard here. We're, we're in New York city. Like we get out at eight 30, like don't come back to the office before six. Like it was a hustle culture for sure. And I kind of hooked onto that hustle culture. And it wasn't like this, you know, 24 seven hustle stuff you hear people promoting. It was just like, Hey, during the hours that we normally work, we're going to work hard. And so I learned at that company to work really hard and to be what I would call a doer, somebody who does things, who gets things accomplished. Um, and I became known for that. And I had a brand for that. So when I got to, to patient pop, one of the things I took from the, the first sort of 10 years of my career was be a doer be someone who goes out and makes things happen. And so when I was hired as the VP of sales there, I was hired as the VP of sales early days of just one person. He was a previous rep that had worked for me. And I didn't sit back and say, Max, go out and do. I grabbed my bag and my computer. I sat down. I ran through the demo a hundred times the first day. I tried to perfect it within a week. And then I was out the door signing up 40, 50, 60 customers in my first few months. And, and so to me, it was that, that hustle, that doing, that going out and making it happen mentality that I learned from my early days that really was the catalyst for growth. Yeah, you often, uh, I think there was a good Dave Gerhardt quote the other day that uh, said every so often when you're in a leadership position, you need to dip your toe back into kind of that doer phase. Also just to prove to your team that, hey, uh, you know, I'm here for a reason. I can still come back and, you know, execute and do this. Like I was there once and uh, I, I thought that was a good quote from him uh, recently because I think it's, you know, similar, similar to what you're saying, which is, you know, at the end of the day, uh, like if I'm going to have to go get it done, I'll go get it done. But uh, I need to show my team too, like how we can make this look good. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a believer. Like uh, you put any number in front of me, even if it seems really difficult, I at least believe that it can be done. And I think um, having that optimism is part of what you need early stage in a sales organization. You have to have some optimism because if you don't, you're kind of dead in the water. So. Hey, uh, Justin, it, it also seems really valuable to have an executive 
at that level selling into your first dollars because my guess is you had to play more than just a sales role in that. And like, yeah. there's probably a lot that you learned that shaped the go to market for that business in the early days. So I, I don't know if that's a factor or not, but can you like, can you talk about the impact that that had and how you sort of, how that played into what you learned? Totally. I, I think when I, when I talk with early executives now, who are struggling, oftentimes they make assumptions and they don't want to be wrong. So they're like, this is the thing I think is going to work and I want to prove that it's going to work. And for me, uh, and this will kind of uh, tether back to your question, like I don't care about being right. I care about getting it right. So I had an assumption totally. of, uh, I, have an, I had an assumption of why, why physicians would buy patient pop, why office managers would buy patient pop and we sell into f- uh, physician practices. And I got some of it right, but I got a lot of it wrong. And so very early stage, I was just taking feedback, taking notes, bringing it back to the office and saying, hey, I just learned X today, or I just learned Y today. How do we bake that into our, our presentations? How do we bake that into our discovery? How do we bake that into our demonstrations moving forward? And, and by doing that and by being open-minded and, and listening to our customers and having access to our, our earliest customers, I was able to shape a better narrative that you know, ended up being the kind of dialogue that we wanted to have with our physician practices for the next four and a half years. Yeah. And, and that's just to get them to complete the sales motion, right? Mm-hmm. What we mm-hmm. try to get across to CS leaders and even CSMs is that we need to continue shaping the customer journey in that same way throughout the life cycle, right? By learning and bringing back what we're learning from interacting with the customers. Like what are the things that trip them up? What are the things that cause them to not adopt the software or not complete the onboarding program or not attend the training? Like it never stops really. So I think that's interesting that you, uh, you know, it, it, there's definitely more, more alike than C, in CS and sales than I think normally meets the eye. So totally. I love that you share that story. Totally. I, I see, you know, some organizations, like at my previous job at Patient Pop, we had sales and we had implementation managers because we had some implementation to do to get folks live. And then we had our customer success managers, so our folks that took care of our, our customers. And they're way more alike than you might think. And part of, I think, the most the best that those three teams can work together is when they have something that I call one continuous conversation. So if I'm a physician customer in the, in the example of patient pop, when I'm having a conversation with my salesperson, when I'm having a conversation with my implementation person, and when I move on to my CSM, I should feel as though I am talking to one person. It should be flowing, continuous, same, uh, same value points, same talk tracks. Uh, and when it's disjointed, that's, that's when things fall apart. So I believe that there's a lot of, um, really necessary cohesion between those three teams at, at, at high growth companies. Yeah, that's, um, it's, you know, one of the topics that we wanted to dive into a little bit more too. You know, I think we uh, share the same thought, you know, how do we, how do we make it, how do we make it so that uh, the customer doesn't feel like they're interacting with three different companies if they are interacting with three different people at the organization. Um, so when you think about that concept of one continuous conversation, um, how do you, how did you kind of approach that or how do you approach it now even with your, your customers um, or your clients from your uh, consulting practice to think about um, getting that continuous conversation? Is it, you know, having, is it start in marketing with kind of the messaging that we're putting out? Is it start in sales? Um, are we, you know, getting CSMs, you know, trained up on sales techniques and learning some of the, the language that you guys are using? Like I'm curious, how, how do you kind of tactically think about getting that cohesion and that alignment? Yeah, I, I don't think it starts tactically. I think it starts strategically. And I don't think it comes from any of those departments. I think it comes from the CEO. And so to me, it's, yeah. super, top, it's super top down. And I think the CEO can do a few things. The, the CEO can do, do really provide the why behind uh, our software, our services, our products, the, uh, the ways that we talk to our customers. There should all be a why from the CEO. It can't be that sales says X is the right way to talk to customers. And then customer service says, no, I actually think it's Y. And marketing says, well, the actual messaging is A. And you've got all this disjointed talk. To, to me, it's got to come from the CEO. What's the mission, vision, values of the company? How do we talk to our customers? What's our value proposition? What are we trying to help them do? And then that needs to get stitched down into each part of the organization. And I think as you move from taking that messaging, and it might sound slightly different coming in a marketing slick versus versus a salesperson's mouth versus the way an implementation manager talks, but it has to be pretty cohesive and consistent. And so I think those things are really important. And then I think lastly, in order to really have this one continuous conversation, it's really critical that each person in the line understands everyone else's job. 
So um, marketing has to understand what sales is tasked with doing. Sales has to understand why marketing is choosing to market to the leads they're marketing to. When it comes into an implementation manager, they have to understand the anxiety and the struggle and the challenges the salesperson went through. When the salesperson is listening to the IM implement the deal, they got to understand how many deals they're working with, how many customers are trying to get them on board, how stressed out they are. To me, it's like, you know, it's cliche, but it's like a family, right? Like everyone sort of has to understand everyone else's uh, role in, in, in what they're doing in their lives. And if you don't understand that, to me, it's just super disjointed. And that's when you get that, those, those butting heads and those arguments. Yeah, we, we often talk about, everybody hates the sports analogies, but if you think about the, the diversity of skill sets on a football team or a soccer team or a basketball team, or whatever sport it is you like. Sure. I mean, you can't you can't actually win a game unless you have in, in football you have a you know somebody guarding the line and then a quarterback and then somebody running the ball and a kicker. Like you have to have all those different different positions on the field represented very very well, and they're all coordinated, right? It's not like you just show up and everybody does whatever they want to on the field. So I like the idea. I mean, and, and we see it all the time, right? If the, if there's not tight alignment at the from the top down, from the executive level down, maybe CEO, maybe second in command, whoever it is, it's got to be top down or, or the strongest department wins, right? If I have mm -hmm. a strong sales leader, then strategy is set by sales. If I have a strong marketing leader, the strategy is set by marketing. Strong CS leader and everybody else is weak, then it's only what the customers, you know, need and not really what the, what the new business demands are. So we, we, we see that same thing playing out all the time. Um, and, and, you know, I, I think one of the most underappreciated things on the CS side and I'll just call it the post-sale world, including things like sure. engineering and product is that we don't often uh, appreciate how hard it is to actually bring a dollar in the door. It's hard work, maybe harder than anybody can, can, uh, can recognize. Yeah. I think it's really important that there's that appreciation and that respect across different departments. So, you know, I, I might hear, you know, the head of product or a CTO say, you know, once we do X, then it's going to be a quote unquote layup. It's going to be easy. Customers are going to be lined up around the door. And, and maybe in some self-service markets, maybe that's true. That's awesome if you, can, if you can make that happen. But oftentimes it's not quite as easy as you think. Now on the, on the flip side, you got the salespeople wondering, what are we getting new products? When are we, are we going to onboard our customers faster? Man, this CSM didn't reach out to my customer in time. Respecting and understanding their job as well. But again, to me, that's the role of the CEO. Like, I don't mean to put it all on the CEO, but hiring the right executive leaders, um, giving people the right mission, vision, values, the right why behind it, and then compensating people accordingly. I've been part of a, uh, organizations where salespeople are making all the money, the IMs and the CSMs yep. and the marketing folks aren't making any money. There's a huge rift. Like, pay people, to, pay people to do what they do really well, whether it's bringing a dollar in the door or taking care of your customers. Because in today's world, which is no longer growth at any costs, which is all about really high quality revenue, strong margins, expansion revenue, you know, increasing your install base, customer success is incredibly crucial. Like you could make an argument that right now in the times that we're in, that they are the most crucial part of the pre-sales, sales, or post-sales team. And I've always believed that as a sales leader. And that's why I think I've had some really good, maybe we call it luck working with some strong CS leaders. I, I predict that there will be a rebalancing of compensation yep. in the next two to five years. I believe that you will see your CSMs, your post sales folks um, start to see an increase in compensation. I believe that your closing salespeople will, will slowly start to see a decrease in compensation. And I believe that your opening salespeople, your SDRs, your marketing development reps will see an increase in compensation. And what I think you'll see is across the board, it'll start to stabilize as people recognize that not one of those roles drives the valuation of a business, right? You can go out and make a bunch of sales. They all churn, right. they all, if they all don't get taken care of, doesn't matter. Your business, your business is not highly valued. If you open the door well, close the door well, take care of your customers, sell back into your install base, increase your expansion revenue, yep. increase your lifetime value. That's a valuable business. Man, I need to, I want to get that printed, put it up on my wall. Seriously. <laughs> that is like, um, preaching to the choir here. Um, well, I know, you know, you just mentioned, obviously starting with the kind of CEO, the narrative needs to be, you know, from the top down. Um, and so, you know, I think two topics that we're, going to dive into a little bit and trying to think, you know, from a customer success perspective and the, the sales perspective, how we can uh, make sure, like you said, kind of uh, get appreciation on both sides. So um, I think one of the uh, often kind of concepts or the uh, discussions that you hear from the customer success side is this whole, you know, was the client an actual fit? Were they a fit for a product? Did we sell them the right thing? Um, you know, or is this industry or use case the right fit? 
Um, and, you know, I think it's always the, the case that you hear of customer success saying, oh, was it the right fit? And sales saying, oh, did we screw up maybe, you know, and what we were kind of servicing them with or actually, uh, you know, giving them on the success side. So I'm curious, um, just your initial take, like, how do you think about that, that kind of the fit question and, um, yep. and how do you kind of take your perspective on it? Yeah, I just think fit can't be subjective. Like I just, I hate subjectivity in my, in my ICP or my fit. Like when I walk into in advising our consulting client today, which is, which is what I'm doing. And I ask them like, tell me about who you sell to and why. And there's seven different answers. And it's like, Hey, we sort of do this. And sometimes it, this works and sometimes this doesn't work. Like to me, it's just your, it's a recipe for disaster. I like objective fits and I like the objective fits to be determined by the stakeholders across the organization. So frankly, it should be your, your CTO. This is how the product is designed to work. And this is who takes advantage of the product and who uses the product effectively. Here is who does not use the product effectively based on data. It's from your sales team. Who does this message resonate with? Who listens to us when we speak? Who's raising their hand? That's marketing, right? Who's raising their hand and opting in? Who's looking for a solution like that? And then it's listening to your, your customer success stakeholder, which is like, what, which customers are our, are our lowest value, highest kind of pain in the butt for lack of a better term, right? Like who should we not be servicing just based on the interactions that we're having? And those stakeholders need to get in the room and you might learn that over time and it might change over time, but it's like, hey, today the right customer has A, B, C, and D. So if you go out and you sell it and it's only got A and B and not C and D, then it's on sales. If it's got A, B, C, and D and the implementation manager forgets to show up for the implementation call and the customer churns before they ever launch, it's on implementation. And everyone has to be just crystal clear, line in the sand accountable for um, meeting, those, meeting those criteria. And if it's not well-defined, then what do you expect? Like, do you expect Jimmy, the sales guy or, or Darla, the sales girl to be like, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to try and shrink, shrink my TAM by figuring out what the right criteria is. No, they're going to go out and sell to everyone they can sell to. So that again has to come from the, the stakeholders at the top. And I think it has to be well-defined. What do you think about this idea of, um, we're going to try a new market segment that we haven't really been in yet. And we have an opportunity that's come up. And so let's go ahead and sell the deal and see if it works. You ever been in that kind of situation before? And how's it, how does it, how does that play out? How do you think about that in terms of building a yeah. strategy top down? Yeah. I don't like ad hoc strategies. I don't like, Hey, we've sort of stumbled across something and we don't know if it's going to work. So let's divert resources to this to figure it out. I would rather say, Hey, we have an assumption or a hypothesis that this particular customer segment that we've never sold to or serviced might work. And then go through the exercise I just described. Does everyone agree? Why, why not? Okay, let's make some assumptions. What do we believe will be the biggest pain point? What will we believe will be the biggest benefit to our company? And then get all the stakeholders in the room, identify what we think the criteria are, and then start small. I, I don't like when people say, I have a hunch. Let me go on board 100 customers only to find out that, you know, the, the product or service you're selling to them doesn't actually meet their needs. Why not go out and say, we're going to bring on five customers. We're going to do it, you know, freemium or low cost. We're going to get some agreement from those customers that they're beta customers, early testers, and that they're going to provide feedback on an ongoing basis in order to understand whether or not we're meeting their needs. Like all that has to be tested on in a really well-defined, small stakeholder driven test. So that, that's sort of how I think about it versus ad hoc. Yeah. Totally I, like makes that. Sense. I like that too. That's something that we talk to our clients a lot about um, as we think about adjusting the customer success strategy or the, the journey, however you want to think about those touch points is, you don't necessarily have to go do a blanket. Let's just go change it for everybody. But how can we look at cohorts? How can we look at these tests, kind of the test and sample? Um, and I think, you know, the, you could try and dive back into why uh, people don't really have the same thought process as we do in the scientific world of, Hey, let me put a hypothesis out there. Let me go get the data and test whether that hypothesis is right or wrong and then adjust. Um, I think it's just very rare that you kind of see that in the business world because oftentimes people don't want to look wrong. They don't want to have the wrong assumptions. Um, but I think we, we try and coach our clients to, to think in that manner um, because you need to be able to move quickly, especially I'm sure you've seen in these early stage companies where you're, um, you know, you're moving fast, you might be growing very quickly as well. Like you have to be able to adapt to the situation. And so having a hypothesis and being able to get clear stakeholders and accountability in the room um, and then come back in the room later and say, hey, this test didn't work, uh, but here's what we learned from it. How can we adjust this, you know, moving forward, I think is really powerful in those early days as well. And you, you can't do it if you have the wrong sales leader. Like just to be clear, the, 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 the most likely executive leader in that group to be threatened by 
rigidity, data, process in early stage businesses and sometimes even in later stage is your sales leader. Because sales is a game of performance, right? We see that individual contributors perform their way up the ladder. They perform into a manager, they perform into a director, they perform into a VP. And so by the time they get into the VP world, they do what they always do, which is run 100 miles an hour, try and get as many bookings as possible or revenue as possible without thinking of the long-term consequences to the business as well as an engineer who's structural, right? Who is using rigidity on a regular basis to build better products. So picking the right sales leader is critical in um, running tests, running experiments, being data-driven. And, um, you know, by nature, we're not always that way. We, um, another concept that I just brought up as well, and we were actually talking on a podcast earlier about this, um, you know, that they had asked us, one of the questions was, um, you know, who owns retention? Like who owns the metric of retention? And our response was uh, that really it should be a like CEO-driven initiative that the executive team should actually ha- all have a stake in retention. And I think this yes. goes back to the concept you're talking about a lot, which is, um, you know, if we're thinking about the long-term viability of the business, if we're thinking about what rec- a recurring revenue business means, lo- lifetime value, increasing all these things, then retention really is on all of the executive leaders' plate because the, you know, from the technology side and the development side, we need to develop the right things. Uh, the sale, you know, sales team needs to go sell it right. Uh, marketing needs to do all the right things. So all of those things need to come in place in order for us to have um, kind of long-term retention and strong retention uh, as we go down. So I'm sure I'm preaching to the choir and I'm, I'm you know, already probably like uh, just giving you the answer in your mouth, but um, I'm sure you probably share a similar sentiment that, you know, that, that needs to come down from the, the top as well. Yeah, it does. And I think the most interesting thing that people don't think about is they think about retention and CS, those two things kind of like naturally go together, right? CS is in charge of retention because that's who customer success is and and that's fine. Um, But let me give you an example of where customer retention can fall on marketing, right? So salesperson says all the right things, sells all the right way, customer closes, moves on to implementation, does all the right things, gets it live, goes on to customer success. They treat the customer really well, customer churns. You go back, you look at the marketing message. The marketing message is grow your revenue by 500% in eight months by using X company. Well, if you're saying that the results are going to be here, instead of growing 500%, they go 300%, then guess who's churning, right? So your marketing message actually caused churn in the very beginning of your funnel. And no one's thinking about that. No one's like, hey, is everything that we're doing from the moment a customer interacts with our business all the way until they decide to leave our business, like, let's check all those different spots. Let's, let's, do, a, let's do an annual physical on our, on our different organizations and departments to make sure that, you know, we're not causing churn somewhere that we don't, we don't anticipate it. And I've seen that happen. So I think that's just kind of interesting. Yeah. I like the tangible example too. And this, um, you know, I think the second topic that we were thinking about here too, and this kind of plays into that is um, thinking about the transition points along the customer journey. And so, um, you know, I think one of the big ones obviously is uh, we have closed the sale um, where all the paperwork is signed, it's over the line. And we're kind of now looking at that first transition into kind of a, Hey, you were dealing with a salesperson. Now this is your first real foray into engaging with our company. Um, how do you think about that transition? Is there a couple of key things from your side of things as you look at the kind of the selling motion um, and getting the, t- the right team involved from onboarding or implementation as well as customer success? Are there a couple of key points that you think about during that transition that are really kind of critical to make sure that companies get right? Definitely. I, I think um, it's more a key miss that I see. So if you look at like, let's take an account executive at a business, right? A salesperson who's selling a deal. They know what information they need to collect to be successful at the sale generally. Like I need to learn this. I need to learn their challenges. I need to learn whether or not they've tried anything, what they've spent money on, what competitors they've tried. There's like a laundry list of things that they're collecting, right? And so they, they have this collection of stuff at the end of closing a deal and they take Um, hopefully I can use bad language. They take all that shit and they just put it into Salesforce and they push it over to the implementation manager. And they're like, Hey, here's all my messy notes, like best of luck, kind of trying to decipher what, what's, what happened during the sale versus being, being again, really defined rigidly, like from the implementation team, what are the six things that I, that you need in implementation in order to have an excellent conversation with the customer in order to guide them through the implementation process effectively? What are those things? How do you ask them? What kind of answers are we looking for? What does the wrong answer look like? What does an answer look like where I haven't gotten enough information? Like, what does that look like? And then build that into your sales process. 
So as you're selling, you're naturally learning the things that implementation is going to need to know to have a great implementation process. Implementation doing the same thing. Hey, it's time to get you live. During the questions, during the back and forth, during the discovery, they're learning things that the next person needs to know, the customer success manager, or however, however your, your process flows. To me, it's all about being educated about the next person up and what they need to do in order to be effective at their job. And if you don't teach those things, train them and put some process around it, then it's, it's, it's likely everyone will just do what's best for themselves. Yeah, you're you're like uh, you're telling our story now. I think one of the challenges that that I've seen is that at, I, I would be happy. I think most CS people would be happy most of the time to get a pile of notes, even right. And times they're they're not even getting that from their sales counterparts. And so, and it's and it's tricky, right? Because what's important versus what's not. I think it's what you said is critical. Like, let's define that up front and build it into the sales process. So, like, to get real tactical, I've had challenges trying to work with a sales team to build that structure into, like, the opportunity funnel in Salesforce because then it feels too constricting. And I get it, right? Because, like, we help, we sell for our business and it would be hard for us to keep up with that kind of detail at times. But what's, what's the right balance? Because doing nothing is not right either. So I don't know, what have you seen that's worked? Like what, what yeah. practical advice could we give our listeners? Yeah. Here? Yeah. Lots, lots of things to unpack in, in those statements, which I think, first of all, the fact that like CSMs just want a pile of notes and that would be an improvement shows you where we're at today. Right. It's, it's, yeah, I it's, wasn't picking on you by the way. No, no, you're, you're not in sales, but it's, but it's embarrassing that, that that is, that would be an improvement. Right. And so I, I think tactically, here's what I might recommend. I think when it doesn't work is when the implementation leader or the CS leader or whomever the leader is comes in and tries to say, this is what you need to do for me. Because generally there are nuances in both sales and implementation and customer yeah. success. And we all understand our worlds pretty well. I think what you need to do is have a stakeholder team where you say like, Hey, the leader of CS is going to get together with the leader of sales. She or he is going to say to the other person, these are the things we need. The sales leader is going to take it back and say, thanks so much. You know what? I'm going to massage that a little bit to make it really easy for my sales team to understand, to make it really natural within the sales process and the sales pitch. That's, and then I'm going to store it on the Salesforce record and we're going to make it, we're going to make it um, mandatory. And what I mean by that is you can't, you can't convert a lead into an opportunity without filling out these fields. That's frustrating, but pretty soon it starts to change the behavior, right? I know I need these five things before I can convert it into an opportunity. So I got to do it. I understand it because it was delivered to me by our sales leader. Like, those things I think have to happen as part of the, the handoff process. If you try and bully another department into doing things the way that you want it, that's where you encounter that resistance. And that's why I think it's just totally more so than anything is an easy answer. It's just work together, <laughs> which I yeah. think, you know, it, is so, what, so doesn't that brings up, <laughs> yeah, what, what that brings up for me is that if you're a leader in the organization and you have to work with other departments, you have to look at yourself as part of the leadership team totally. before your functional team, right? I think a lot of, a lot of leaders, a lot of new executives get confused about what team they're on. Just because you run the customer success team doesn't mean you're on the customer success team. It means you're on the leadership team. And that's, I, that, you know, you can go that's back right. to your initial statements. It comes from the CEO, the top down culture. Like what, what kind of execution culture are we creating around that? I, I recently had this talk with another sales leader where I was doing some coaching and he said something to the effect of like, well, that's not like what my team wants or something, something similar to that. I want to try and remember exactly what it was. But I said, your responsibility is to the company at this level. It is to make the right decisions for the company, even when it has a, a, a I don't want to say a negative, but even if it has kind of a, a bad impact on your team, you got to make the right yeah. decision for the company, even when it means going back and delivering challenging news to the sales organization or the field or the insider, whatever you manage, your role, once you get up to be in the executive level, is to make decisions on behalf of the company. And you know, one more kind of tactical thing that I would add to that is, if your salespeople aren't getting the right things to help your customers onboard and get taken care of successfully, that to me is an indicator that they don't understand how, how businesses become healthy. And so what I've seen at really strong companies is when the executive team or the leadership team or the CEO walks the sales, the IM, CS, everybody through what is it like to build a SaaS business? Like, what, are, what does a healthy SaaS business look like? Why does it suck if we sell $30,000 in bookings and 25,000 of them churn within six months? What does that mean for our business? What does that mean for our valuation? Yeah. What does that mean to our cash, our runway, our burn? Like, I think when people learn those things, then it starts to click and they start to say, you know what? I get why this is so important to the health of the business. So that's on the executive team to teach. It's uh, really funny you mentioned that. We've actually given... Uh, 
we've been asked, I think three or four times now to give almost that exact pitch and uh, that exact presentation you just talked about. So we've got, you know, a number of slides built up that basically says, uh, how much does it cost for us to go get a new customer versus retaining an old one? Like, you know, how do all these things play together? So um, certainly can see that. Uh, well, I know we've only got you for a couple minutes, but one of the other questions that I think would just be interesting you, um, you know, I think you mentioned you're uh, in an interim role right now and you've actually got uh, oversight now over uh, kind of sales, uh, marketing, as well as customer success. And so I'm curious, you know, coming from your, your very sales background, um, how is the transition for you and kind of looking at customer success now and, and having kind of the purview of, of that entire revenue cycle? I'm just curious if there's anything that you've learned here in those early days of just uh, kind of getting into that role. Yeah, gosh, it's a great question. I mean, I think what I've learned is that each department is a little more similar to sales than I might have anticipated. And, and let me tell you what I mean by that. Um, everybody in each department wants to own the things they're used to owning right? They, they, they get attached to the things that they do, the things that they're graded on, the things that they get known for. And so what I'm trying to come in and understand in this interim role that I'm in as, as CRO is like, where is that keeping us from making the right decision? Right? And so I'll give you an example of, of, of where I see teams making the wrong decision, at least in my opinion. And by the way, I could be wrong. Um, you know, there's CSM teams that take care of customers and you're struggling with churn. Meanwhile, I, you know, I'll dig in to understand what are the other things on their plate and they're also tasked with cross-selling and upselling. And I'm asking myself, well, hold on. I'm hearing that, you know, churn's a problem. I'm hearing that our customers aren't getting talked to enough. We're not having enough quality assurance calls, but we're also cross-selling and upselling. Those two things, in my opinion, are, are at odds with one another. Now, you could, you could argue that cross-selling the right product or upselling the right product helps improve retention. I agree with those things. But if you also tell me that we're not talking to our customers enough, then there's misalignment there. So some of the things that I'm trying to do is say, hey, I appreciate that you like cross-selling and upselling. I appreciate that you have bonuses tied to that. But you know what? I want your core role, your core responsibility, your core competency to be taking care of our customers. And you know what? I want to start moving that cross-sell and upsell outside of the CSM and craft a, a separate team that who's completely in charge of working with their CSMs to make sure that they're selling the right product into their install base to further improve retention. So that's just like an example of what I see exactly. is not, not wanting to give up some of that stuff that they've been doing. Outside of that, the other thing that I've learned is, and I learned this a long time ago, so um, is I don't, I'm not that smart. So I don't, I don't know how to run marketing teams. I don't know how to run CS teams, to be frank. What I, what I do know is how to work with really strong people and give them the autonomy to be excellent. And if you, you know, put really good people in positions of leadership, if you allow them to build really strong teams, if you give them autonomy, um, I think what you'll find is that if you get the right person, they're up for the task. And so I really lean heavily on my marketing and CS peers to be my guide. And I'm just here to remove roadblocks and make their jobs easier. So that, that's sort of the things that I've learned, you know, in the first few months. That's awesome. I love the example you gave, um, you know, thinking about the, the metrics that are on the plate and, and how they might be at odds with one another. I think we come across that scenario a lot. Uh, well, we've got one last question and I'm sure apologize because I think we're over time, but I got one last question that normally is pretty easy, but we always like to ask what is uh, I don't know if you have a whiteboard anywhere around you or if you, if you are a, a notes guy in your phone or if you have a to-do list, but what's one thing that's on your to do that you have to get done before the end of this week that you feel like is just utterly important uh, that's on there. Wow. I'm looking at it right here. You know, you know what? Um, it's probably not relevant, but here's something that I'd like to, I'd like to get accomplished. I, I'd like to write, um, I'd like to write a very long blog post about what I've learned in the last eight months, um, consulting and advising, uh, for SMB SaaS businesses and share that because I think, um, you know, there's some valuable lessons in there and I, I like to write in short pithy sentences and you might see me writing on some social media platforms and things like that, but blogging, I hate. So um, I've put that on my to-do list and I'd like to try and get that accomplished. And outside of that, it's maybe have a couple of Aperol spritz and listen to some music and spend some time with my wife. Awesome. That's a perfect That's way to end it. Well, I can't read, read that blog. Uh, Justin, thanks for all the time. I know we're, we're, uh, you're very gracious and we've taken a lot of it, but uh, this was good for us. I know we could probably find you know, a number of other topics to go down because I think you've, uh, you've certainly got some great insights. So appreciate it. Cool. If, if anyone else wants to learn anything about what I do or who I am, the easiest way to get a hold of me is just to go to my website, which is theofficialjustin.com. It's just theofficialjustin.com. Or they can email me at hello at theofficialjustin.com. Perfect. Perfect. We'll make sure to uh, plug that into our notes as well. Cool. 
Awesome. This was really fun, guys. It's a, you know, a different perspective than, than I usually get and that I usually, you know, chat chat about. So hopefully it added some value to the, the CS folks and uh, love, to, love to keep it going. Hey, guys, thanks so much for taking the time to listen to the Gain, Grow, Retain podcast. If you liked what you heard, please take a moment and share the podcast with your friends and colleagues and subscribe. We really appreciate it. Talk to you soon.